the state of New Jersey accused me of murdering three complete, shooting four, murdering three complete strangers, people I never knew existed on this planet in a New Jersey park. The saint sought the death penalty. The odds of my being alive today <laughs> was not exactly in my favor. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. 20 years ago, on February 27, 1988, all charges were dropped against Reuben Carter. Now, the name may not be familiar unless I say Reuben Hurricane Carter. Hurricane Carter was the boxer who in the 1960s was convicted unjustly of three horrific murders and was sent to prison and who rotted there for nearly 19 years. He was the subject of the movie The Hurricane starring Denzel Washington. Several years ago he spoke at Sacred Heart University in Bridgeport, Connecticut and we're airing a portion of that video today. Then back to Israel, Palestine to a talk and interview that was given in the summer of 2007 in Nazareth, Israel with a leader of the Israeli displaced Palestinians. These are members of the community that was thrown out of their homes in the period 1947-1950. About a quarter of the present Israeli Palestinian population are their descendants. Uh, these are people who were, is, were and are Israeli citizens who never left Israel, but who were never left back into their homes. Finally, an interview with Eric Triffin, who's head of the health department in West Haven, Connecticut, about tobacco. In past shows, we've covered the scandal concerning the fact that the states are squandering the money that was given to them in the huge tobacco settlement fund and they're not using it to try to keep kids away from tobacco addiction. We talk with Eric Triffin about what could be done if some of the hundreds of millions or just a portion were spent on programs to keep people away from tobacco. On the face of it, the charge was absurd. Reuben Carter, a successful and wealthy prize fighter at the top of his game, supposedly went with a high school student he barely knew into a strange bar, killed three perfect strangers, and then continued on a night of recreation. But such was the racism in the United States in those days that an all-white jury saw nothing wrong and looked at the evidence and convicted them. It took a federal judge or a number of appeals judges over 20 years before the convictions were thrown out. In 1966, at the age of 29, I was married to a very beautiful lady, had a very beautiful three-year-old daughter. I was making over $100,000 a year. Forty years ago, $100,000 a year was big money. <laughs> I had a great big house in the suburbs. I'm the only one living out there, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I had a 36-foot yacht in the Atlantic Ocean. Two Chrysler engines. I had wild horses running up on the mountain. I had a custom-made El Dorado with my name emblazoned in silver on the side. There's a family member right there. Tell them, girl. <laughs> Blazing on the side. Oh, yeah. I was a high-profile prairie chick. Oh, yeah. I was, a ne I was a neon sign with a chip on my shoe. But I was at the peak of my career, a professional prize fighter about to fight for the championship of the world. And the next thing I knew, I was fighting for my very life on trial in criminal court. The, the state of New Jersey accused me of murdering three complete 
shooting four, murdering three complete strangers, people I never knew existed on this planet, in a New Jersey park. The saint sought the death penalty. The odds of my being alive today <laughs> was not exactly in my favor. You know what I mean? There were three murder victims. All of them were white. The jury was all white. The judge, the police, the state's witnesses, and the prosecutor were all white. I, at that time, was black. <laughs> was based principally on the testimony of two career criminals who claimed, with the help of a $10,000 reward and promises of leniency for crimes that they had committed, which would have ended them in prison for 90 years, claimed they saw me at the scene. Even though I did not remotely fit the description of the assailants, Two tall, light-skinned men, 5'11 to 6 feet tall, weighing 170 to 190 pounds, both of equal height, both wearing pencil-lined mustaches. Even though the two surviving victims did not and could not identify me and even said it was not me, even though I had a number of credible alibi witnesses placing me elsewhere at the time of the crime. And even though I passed the lie detector test showing that I had no involvement, and even though I testified voluntarily in front of a grand jury and was exonerated, I was still convicted. But luckily, <laughs> if you can call a help, of a triple life sentence, a successful prize fighter, and had the money to pay for a first rate lawyer, I escaped execution. And by that fact alone, my innocence remained alive. And I was able to fight for my free from prison. Free from triple prison. <laughs> Present day Nazareth is a city in northern Israel filled with Israeli Arabs, or you could call them Palestinians, with Israeli citizenship. It is the location of the Association for the Defense of the Rights of the Internally Displaced Persons in Israel. Internally displaced is a bizarre category. It's made up of Israelis who are forced out of their homes by Israeli authorities and who are forbidden to go back into their homes because the land and the homes are wanted for Israeli Jewish citizens. In July of 2007, I was in Nazareth as part of a tour and listened to a talk and did an interview with Daud Bader, who is the coordinator of the association. I present an excerpt of his talk, how he tells about how the people of his own village were thrown out of their homes and were denied permission to go back even though an Israeli court ruled in their favor 50 years ago. من قريتهم في في 26 جانيوري 1950 سنتين تقريبا بعد قيام الدولة. So his village, the Gabsiya, they evicted the people on the 26th of January 1950 after two years from the birth of the state of Israel. No. أهل الغبسية قريتي 
حاولوا عدة مرات يرجعوا لقريتهم ولكن كان باستمرار الجيش والشرطة العسكرية تردهم Uh, well, uh, the, the people of his uh, uh, village, they tried so many times to go to back to their village, but they were uh, not allowed and they were forbidden to go there by the police and the army. They pushed them away not to come to the village. في سبتمبر أيلول 1951 رجعوا بعدد كبير مشان يسكنوا في بيوتهم ويخلقوا أمر واقع. Okay, and uh, uh, after that, in 1951, they tried to come back, you know, all of them with a big number in order to settle or to come back, to resettle in their village, but they were not allowed to. The military forces took them, for those who took دفعتهم غرامات في المحاكم غرامات باهظة بهذاك الوقت ومنهم من بقي بالسجون الأشهر. The police there they just jailed them and they asked them to pay fine for the coming to the, their village and many of them they stayed in prison for months. بعد هذا توجهوا أهل القرية لمحكمة العدل العليا الإسرائيلية. ونجحوا ب 30 11 51 بقرار من المحكمه العليا الاسرائيليه بحقهم بالعوده لقريتهم. Okay, on the 30th of uh, uh, November 1951 they uh, had to claim their case to the Supreme High Supreme Supreme High Court in Israel and they succeeded in the verdict to the verdict to come back to their country, to their village. القرار كان ب 30 11 واسبوع بعد هذا في 8 12 51 رجعوا اهل الغبسيه سكنوا تنفيذ لقرار المحكمه رجعوا على الغبسيه ولكن الجيش منعهم كمان مره بحجه انه اعلنوا عن موقع القريه منطقه عسكريه مغلقه. On 8 8th of December 1951 those people they went back to settle or to stay in their village by the verdict of the court from there, but the police forbids them to go there as they claim that the site is not allowed for people to go in because it is a military closed zone. طبعا ليش اعلنوا عن القريه منطقه عسكريه مغلقه؟ حتى يمنعوا تنفيذ قرار المحكمه الاسرائيليه وهم اعتمدوا بهذا الاعلان على على قوانين الطوارئ من 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 اللي سنها الاستعمار البريطاني على فلسطين سنه ال 45 اه سو دي 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 جاست ديكلير ذات ذيس از ا ميليتري كلوز زون اند دي ريفير ذات تو ذا لو ان 1948 فروم ديورينج ذا بريتش مانديت ذات ذيس از ا ميليتري زون ذات نو بات ان اوردر نوت to uh, fulfill the verdict of the court. كمان ما كمان الاهل الصفوري قريه صفوري اللي بعيده 2 كيلو من هون فقط هجروهم سبع شهور بعد اقامه اسرائيل. Okay, you remember yesterday we passed by the Safuri Tsipori, the city of Tsipori and I mentioned to you about that. It is the same case, it's around 1 mile from here. were also after seven months from the uh, birth of the state of Israel, they were all deported from there. سكان قرية أم الفرج بجانب مدينة نهرية هجروا سنة 53 بعد خمس سنوات بعد قامة الدولة. Okay, Um uh, al-Faraj is another village near Nahariya. Nahariya is near Akka where we've been yesterday. Yes, in the northern part. And they were four four months. Uh, 1953. In 1953. I mean, this is the story of the Muhajirin. But they were وبصحفية واسعة وأجزاء أخرى بنشاط أقل منهم ولكن الجميع ناضلوا والجميع طالبوا بالعودة وخاصة باستعادة أراضيهن اللي تمت مصادرتها على أساس قانون الحاضر غايب
okay, the struggle of, this is the story of the struggle of those people who just left their uh, country or their homes, as I said to you, I was telling you on the bus most of the time, and that is the place, uh, the, that is the case of those Palestinians to be called the emigrants or to be called the refugees uh, of the country. And don't forget that if they were not, they did not refuge only in Palestine, but they went to Jordan, if you remember that also. Many of them, they were in Jordan. يعني يعني في سنة 53 تمت مصادرة أراضي الـ 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 يعني المهجرين في داخل إسرائيل على أساس قانون الحاضر غايب أو غايب بيعتبروه غايب يعني القانون الغريب من نوعه بمعنى أنا إذا بدي أستعيد أرضي يعتبروني غايب ولكن إذا بدي أبيعهن إياها بيعتبروني حاضر بمضوني على وثائق وعلى وراء وكل وبخلص كل شيء. أو the Israeli law is that this is the law of the absence. They call it the absence that they consider you as even though you live here, but you're absent. You are not you are not to get your land back, even though you are staying here. You won't get your land back. But if you want to sell it to them, you're present. In Nazareth, I'm speaking with Dawood Bader of the Association for the Defense of Rights of Displaced Persons in Israel. How many people are we talking about when you mean displaced persons? Oh, I'm sorry. Come one. Ah, okay. Here. The refugees, the Palestinians in Israel, we consider them. بربع السكان الفلسطينيين اللي بيعيشوا في اسرائيل لحد اليوم والرقم التقديري تبعنا هو بحدود 300000 لاجئ داخلي uh, it is uh, approximately 1 over 4 quarter of the population that they live in israel today but he's talking about a figure which is around 300000 and we're talking about people who have Israeli citizenship. Is that right? تماماً جميعنا بنحمل الهوية الزرقاء الهوية المواطن الإسرائيلي إحنا الدولة بتعتبرنا مواطنين بكل معنى الكلمة ولكن لحد إسا بترفض إعادة حقنا إلنا شو حقنا يعني حق إني أرجع أبني بيتي اللي هذا هذا مولية وأستعيد أرضي اللي صادروها مني. Consider, considered as we are considered as a, a Israeli citizen with the Israeli ID and it was forced you know that to also to have the Israeli passport but they are refusing to give us or give us back our rights you know what Questions. we mean by our what is the name of your original uh, town village and where is it uh. يعني, uh, I am displaced from the village of El Gabsiya since 1950. Uh, my village uh, is 10 kilometers uh, south of the Lebanese border. And, uh, Six kilometers east of Nahariya, of the city of Nahariya. And what is there now? Is it a Jewish town? Is it in ruins? What is in that place now? Uh, the village now is empty. Uh, the houses of, of the village were uh, demolished uh, in, uh, in the year 1956. And uh, there is only the one building uh, still stay, staying uh, uh, there, uh, the mosque, the building of the mosque in the middle, but uh, with a high fence around the mosque. We are prevented to enter the mosque, to, to pray in the mosque, and to renovate it. And people still want to go back? The people still want to, to come back to, to their uh, own uh, properties, uh, to, to, uh, to renovate the mosque, to, to uh, rebuild once more the houses in the village where they born or their uh, uh, grand uh, sons. Thank you very much. Palestinian 
Israeli citizens have been on the move recently. Some 10,000 protested in Nazareth against the slow strangulation of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. In early February, there was even a bigger demonstration in the Palestinian town of Sakhnin. There, the people were furious of the decision of the Israeli Attorney General to end the investigation into the deaths of 13 Palestinians, Israeli citizens, who were killed at a demonstration inside of Israel in the year 2000. Israeli Palestinians make up some 20% of the Israeli population. Eric Triffin, what could be done if there was substantial amounts of money that were given to the cities? What could be done to do a tobacco prevention program? Well, first, as the Attorney General and others were saying, we should fund the prevention of continuation of smoking so that people, especially on Medicaid, could get uh, treatment for this horrific illness. But in terms of actual prevention, beyond uh, that, we could go into the schools, we could do athletic programs, we could do nutrition programs that show how to respect and care for your body in ways that do not pollute it and that make it stronger. So I think there's a multitude of ways we could go at this, and in the community at large, we could reimburse people for taking any health class that would help strengthen their health orientation, whether it's smoke cessation, stress management, better nutrition, weight watchers, aerobics, aerobics with their children. We could work wonders with this kind of money that is now being spent uh, anywhere's but. And I find that is almost criminal not to uh, spend money that could otherwise prevent these illnesses and deaths. So you were saying that someone could take a, an exercise course and then present their proof of it and get money back? Yes, I think for at least within limits, you know, maybe $100 a year, we could reimburse people that ounce of prevention that prevents the need for a pound of cure and to encourage people to go the health route rather than fall prey to these companies and advertising that tries to get them into very bad habits, whether it's fat habits or smoking habits that are truly addictions and that end up sucking money out of their pockets until they die. Could you clarify the situation about Medicaid recipients and programs that would get them off tobacco? Well, at the moment, we do not fund uh, Medicaid programs that can are known to be able to help people quit tobacco use. Uh, we are incurring something in the order of $400 million in health care costs in Medicaid, Medicaid alone in Connecticut. And if we were able to spend some money to prevent uh, tobacco smoking, we could save all that money. Now, in the register, the day that uh, the news came out that t uh, Connecticut was spending nothing on prevention, they did one of these telephone polls. And half the people said, well, you know, we shouldn't spend any money because if people want to smoke, they're going to smoke. You can't persuade people otherwise. Well, you know, there's fatalism and everywhere, but this is a drug that is the most addictive drug in the world and we have allowed it to be perpetrated on people for profit and then the public the rest of the public has to pay for the consequences as well in costs and we have an opportunity here with the tobacco settlement dollars along with the and that's 140 million dollars in Connecticut every year along with the tobacco taxes which is another 250 million so we have almost 400 million dollars every year coming to Connecticut that could be spent on prevention and we all know the line an ounce of prevention could prevent a pound of cure and not just the cure but the suffering in human suffering and we all feel that uh, pain, the families of smokers and every taxpayer. 
You had uh, mentioned in your question to the Attorney General uh, some astounding number on the casualties from tobacco. Could you repeat that? Yes. Well, obviously, in, in um, the United States alone, we're talking over 400,000 deaths a year. Uh, in the worldwide, the number I quoted from the World Health Organization is that one billion people, one billion with a B, will die from the effects of tobacco this century alone. And this is a tragic epidemic that could be eliminated with the stroke of a pen banning tobacco, period. You would be a prohibitionist on tobacco? I would. The way other drugs that are so addictive are at least a controlled substance, and we do not do that here, and the tobacco companies, as they are restricted more and more in the United States and developed world, are looking to China and third world countries to perpetrate this drug that sucks money out of your pocket until you die prematurely in, at that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak with you. You may recall Connecticut's headlines over its dubious achievement of spending zero on tobacco prevention programs in 2008. A number of groups have banded together, and there is bills in the Connecticut legislature calling for an expenditure of some $14 million this year. We'll continue reporting on what happens to this in future programs. Well, that's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. Did you know, are you aware, that one out of every three young black men in this country between the ages of 12 and 27 are under the control of the criminal justice system? Do you know that? One out of three. That's outrageous. There are more young black men in U.S. prisons than there are in this university.